All right. We are in uh, Matthew 7, verses 13 through 29. If you're a visual person, um, we have a nice little mountain that you can look at on the screen. And this is the journey we've all taken together. Um, we, we started with the Beatitudes, right? As that's when we started our hike, this is where we began. We put on the backpacks, we did all the stuff, and we listened to the Beatitudes and kind of, you know, whittled away the ones that didn't really want to take the journey. But then the rest of us went through um, Jesus' teachings, which talked about the greater righteousness in relation to the Torah and piety, the summit being the Lord's Prayer, and we stayed there for a little bit. And then now we've been making the downward trek, uh, talking about how greater righteousness informs the way we use wealth and the way that we relate to people in our family and, um, and our friends and our coworkers. And now as we approach the very bottom of the summit, um, we are presented with two ways, right? We, we've gone through the whole journey. We've climbed and descended the mountain. And now the Lord Jesus says, you can do one or two things with, what all, with all of my teaching. Um, and that, those one or two things accords with um, wisdom or being a moron. Um, it's not really, but the, word, the Greek word for foolish is morose. It's where moron comes from. So, you know, but, yeah, so you could be wise or a moron or foolish. Um, and he gives different, he uses different metaphors to show us what that looks like. And the metaphors he employs are that of a wide gate um, and a wide path and a narrow gate and a narrow path. He talks about um, we could be a tree that bears fruit or we could be a tree that doesn't bear fruit and um, experience the axe laid to its root and thrown in the fire. He talks about um, how we can be like a house that's, that's built on the rock, or we can be like a house that's built on the sand. And the house that's built on the rock, when the, when the wind and the waves come against it, when it experiences the, you know, all of God's, God's judgment, that house, that house that's founded on wisdom stands and the house that's founded on the foolishness, um, it falls. And so that's, that's where we are today. And uh, the title of the sermon is The Wide and the Narrow Gate. And I'm going to read all this for us, and then we'll pray. So this is Matthew 7, and we're going to start in verse 13 and go through the end of the chapter. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits." Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your names? And then he will declare to the charismatics, that was a joke, that was a pretty bad joke. <laughs> then he will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rocks. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for your word, um, its ability to build us up. Lord, we stand in awe of this teaching. It's authoritative for our lives. Um, this is, comes from a man who says, you have to listen to my, to my words. Um, a man who doesn't teach like the scribes and the Pharisees, but who teaches with authority, Lord. We, we stand under his teaching and in all of it, and we just pray that you would help us as we reach the end of this journey of the Sermon on the Mount to, 
to apply it, to look at it one last time and to, and to apply it to our lives and that you would do that, help us do that through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray, O oh Spirit of God, that you would break the bread of life unto us, that you would just make us people who embody your nature and your characteristics, Lord. We want to look more like King Jesus in the interactions we have with our spouses, with our siblings, with our parents. Um, with our with our friends or our extended family, with our co-workers, Lord, with our with our enemies, and with those who love us, Lord. We pray that you would help us do that. You'd help us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is you who works in us both to will and to do for your good pleasure, God. We we love you, and you pray that you would use this word to build us up. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right. So this when we get to the end of the sermon. Um, one of the ways you know that you're approaching the end is because we have sets of imperatives and sets of actions that, are, that, that Jesus stacks on one another. An imperative is a command, all right? So that's what I mean by two sets of commands, and then we see a lot of activity um, towards the end of this sermon. The first set of imperatives that we, we, we get is Matthew 7, 7, with, with ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock, and it will be opened to you. And that correlates to Matthew 7, 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy. Enter, right, that's the imperative. The gate is wide and the way is easy. That leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. And so we have, um, <laughs> we have that word find there, right? Ask, it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open. And then that same word appears later in that second set of imperatives, Matthew 7, 13. Many who, the people who find this narrow gate and way that lead to life, um, they are few. We got two sets of actions that occur in Matthew 7, verse 21, right? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. This is a common theme throughout Matthew. Um, Matthew is able to take... Um, theology, right, and move it into the realm of um, praxis or practicality, uh, more so than maybe some of the other New Testament writers. That's the focus on Matthew. It's not simply knowing God's will. It's being God's will, embodying God's will, doing God's will. That is what Matthew considers the mark of a, a disciple. Um, and that's the way Jesus teaches. In Matthew seven twenty four through 27, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fail because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house, and great was the fall of it. And so that's, we're all, you know, the sermon really, you know, it crescendos to this to this point, we've heard all of Jesus' teaching, and what he sets in front of us are two choices, right? A wide gate and an easy way, and a narrow gate with a difficult way. A nice house that's built and founded on the rock, and a house that's built and founded on the sand. You either hear my words and don't do them, or you hear my words, embody them, and do them. And that's really where we all find ourselves today. I mean, that's I know it sounds like it's just, it's, it's not a very difficult concept to grasp, but that's the way that life works. And I think that that's an important thing to state is that there's an expectation, I think, among people that somehow, some way, we don't necessarily reap what we sow. Um, and I think one of the reasons that people push back on that kind of concept is because it does sound sort of I don't know, sounds sort of judgmental and harsh. But if you just look at the way your life has worked thus far and your objective, you'll see that you are, for the most part, the product of every decision that you've ever made in life. Every decision you've ever made has brought you to where you are. Whether that decision is a good decision or bad decision is irrelevant. You all, we all got here from somewhere. And decisions that are foolish produce foolish results. Decisions that are based on wisdom, right, and the fear of the Lord, have a better outcome. It doesn't mean that it's 
you know, we're not talking about a formula, boom, 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 this all the good always happens. But it's a paradigm of life that I think a lot of people don't, don't think about. And what Jesus is willing to do, which is what most teachers aren't willing to do, is he, he's not afraid to set a standard for people and to hold them to that standard. And it's, it's really remarkable because, you know, we have brothers and sisters in Christ, churches who are, other fri- who are our friends, who we consider partners in the gospel, who would say that is the easiest way to just stifle any growth in your congregation. You, can, you can't hold people responsible for anything. You, what you do is you, you have to cater to what they need and then give it to them. And, you know, that's not the way that the kingdom of God works. Jesus announces the advent of the kingdom of heaven. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what follows that announcement are responsibilities for the people who are going to be part of that kingdom. That's what you read about in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, here is the way that with true wisdom literature, I mean, the Sermon on the Mount is true wisdom literature, right? It reads like the book of Proverbs and the book of James, but the difference is that the person who preaches the sermon is the actual embodiment. The word become flesh. He embodies and is everything to which wisdom literature points. There's something fundamentally different about this teacher and about his teaching. And one of the things that's fundamentally different is he'll say, hey, this, these are my expectations for disciples. If you're wise, you'll listen to me. If you don't want to end up, if you don't want your house to end up in the gulf, you'll, you'll listen to me. If you don't want to end up in the fire of judgment, like the tree, right? I mean, this is metaphorical language that he's, you, you, you'll listen to me. And the, what, I, what he says, the demands that he makes on the world, on us as disciples, can seem difficult. That's why the, that's why the Sermon on the Mount begins with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessedness in the place where everyone who's on the, you know, wide road that comes from the wide gate, they don't want to be. And that's what Jesus does. He says, hey, here's a standard for you to meet. Here is the way we're going to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. And every, every successful organization, right, whether they're spiritual or not, understands this concept. If you decide to wake up in the morning for some reason at 5 and go work out with these jugheads at F3 at 5.30, see? Hey, and hey, SRB, got your PowerPoint. I want you to be happy this week. When, when you get there, there, there are... There's a way that the group carries itself. There are principles and core values of the group that are expected of the people that come. And that's one of the things that makes it successful, is that everyone knows what to expect. They agree to live up to this standard. That's what they do, right? Hey, guess what, guys? How many, how many days is it to Alabama football? I mean, who's got the, somebody has a countdown on their phone. It's their screensaver. Anytime they go to unlock it, it just it's a timer. Anybody? No one in here? <laughs> that was a lot of 20s. Here, here's, the, here's the thing. Whether you like Alabama or not, right? Some of you, let's put this in biblical terms. Some of you are elect. According to the foreknowledge of good football. You know, we don't get to pick, (laughs) but that organization is a successful organization because there are 
there's a standard that everyone in the organization lives up to, right? And everyone is held accountable to that standard, and it's based on, and it's packaged in love for one another. We love each other, so we do the things out of love for our brother that allows our other brother to be successful. This mindset, okay, this mindset, it's a, it's a worldly mindset that businesses use. Its origin is wisdom literature from Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And what, one of the reasons that as disciples of Christ, as churches of, of, of Christ, right, Christ's church, one of the reasons we struggle with that is because we don't think anybody should live to a standard <laughs> because grace excuses it, right? When in all actuality, grace necessitates it. And that's, I think, what we're getting at in Matthew 5. This is not salvation by works. This is a mature, heartfelt, spirit-wrought realization that the king of the universe at whose feet angels bow and at whose speech demons tremble and at whose present mountains quake actually expects his followers to act like something <laughs> and to be something and to embody him, right? And that's what the Sermon on the Mount has taught. Which brings us to the question, what is the narrow gate and the narrow way? And the reason I ask this question is because there's all sorts of answers for it. It really depends on where you come from, right? So every tradition, every, every denomination, however you want to put it, has a narrow gate and a narrow way, an answer for what that is. Right? So if, if you have come from the churches of Christ, the answer is almost literally everything. And I'm not trying to be any way. It just is, right? You get baptized, and then once you get baptized, you think you're okay, and then you figure out that you could be, but there's a lot of other stuff that we have to do to continue to be on the narrow way. And, you know, and it involves a lot of things. Like, we, have, we take communion every week, we we don't do instruments. We may or may not have a kitchen, like blah, 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 right, so on, so forth. But it's not just a Church of Christ deal, folks. It, it is a sinner's prayer kind of deal, right? If you're, if you're a Baptist, it's a, it's a Roman's road kind of deal, or it could be an Arminian or a Calvinistic kind of deal. Um, if you're Methodist, well, I don't even know anymore, and you probably don't either. And if you are, you know, and if, and if you are charismatic, church of God, holiness, church of prophecy. It's straight and narrow is praying through tongues. It could be that, right? It could be the ability to exercise your spiritual gifts. It's, it's holding often to some sort of teaching that is set by someone or something that kind of embodies the group of which you are a part, right? That's why there are Reformed Baptists and Free Will Baptists and um, Missionary Baptists. And Southern Baptist, what other Baptists are there? Primitive Baptists, I can't believe I forgot them. Primitive Baptist, right? Um, and, and you have it. I mean, you just have, you know, the, church, you, the little history lesson, you know, the one cup or Church of Christ. I mean, that's, that was a big deal back in the day. None of you remember it. But the reason it was a big deal was because it says, the cup that we bless, is it not the blood of Christ? It doesn't say cups. And look at you passing around a hundred cups, defiling God a hundred different ways. Well, and, there, and then we're off to the races, right? The narrow gate and the narrow way, to sum it up, is pretty much whatever we want it to be in the name of Jesus Christ. More or less. Well, when you look at this in context, which is what this is attempting to do, you find that the narrow gate in the narrow way is more than likely not what we conceived of it as or what we were taught that it was. The answer to what the narrow gate and the narrow way is is actually given 
and 24 through 29. Namely, these words of mine. That's what Jesus says. Everyone who does these words of mine, everyone who hears them and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Verse 26, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The key to determining what the narrow gate and the narrow way is, is found in Matthew 5, 6, 7. Not necessarily the traditions uh, in which we were brought up. Now, Jesus is teaching. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. When Jesus came and taught, he came as the prophet of whom Moses prophesied. God will raise up a prophet like me from among your own brothers. It is to him whom you shall listen, is what Moses says. When Jesus comes and he, and he teaches in the New Testament, he comes in the line of those prophets. He comes with continuity with them in that Jesus' message in Matthew 5 through 7 is not altogether different from the message that Yahweh gives to his chosen people, Israel, in the Old Testament, right? Where, he, where Jesus has discontinuity, right, with the prophets of the Old Testament is that Unlike them, he sees himself as the authority on the word which he speaks. That's why the crowd marveled at him in verses 28 through 29. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished, for he was teaching them as one who had authority. And that's the point. Jesus is the only prophet that taught like that. He's the only prophet that was the word that he em- that, that he actually taught. He, he was the self-revelation of the teaching that came out of his mouth. He embodied it and was it. He's a teacher, prophet, par excellence. The content of his teaching, however, was not new, which is the ironic thing. He came into a religious institution, namely Judaism, right, who had experienced massive highs and massive lows, a royal kingdom, a nation sent to exile, a destruction of Jerusalem and a destruction of the temple, with a rebuilding of a temple and a rebuilding of the Jerusalem wall. They had experienced it all. And Jesus enters in into this religious context with a teaching that is as old and is congruent with Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. But by the time he teaches that teaching, everybody's shocked at what he's saying. It's like a new word. Well, the message of Deuteronomy 6, 4 is all through Matthew 5, 6, and 7 because you can sum up Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 as the Lord's call for singularity instead of duplicity or doubleness. The Lord your God is one. Yahweh calls for your heart, your soul, your mind, all of your affection, wholehearted devotion to Yahweh. That's it. Well, when you get to Matthew chapter 5 and you look at the themes that tie the sermon together, very quickly, what we see is this is the message of the Sermon on the Mount. What Jesus calls for in the Sermon on the Mount is singularity of purpose and heart and affection, a removal of the duplicity that's eat up Judaism and all of its teachers. Commit yourself to Yahweh, is what Jesus says. Now, don't take my word for it. Just look. Look at Matthew 5, 13 through 16, right? Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. People don't light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And when you combine that with Matthew 6, 23, the eye is the lamp of the body. If the light that is in you is, is, is darkness, how great is that darkness? 
the point that Jesus makes with his teaching of salt and with light and the light being in us meant to be in the light of the world is that duplicitous people, right? People that have double-sided business cards. No offense to Jonathan. If you weren't here, that's, you know, Jonathan's got double-sided business cards. One side says size auto body and repair. The other one says Jonathan Johnson Remax Legacy. Give him a call for all your automotive and home buying needs. That mindset doesn't work here. There's no hyphens in the Christian life. That's why, you ever wonder what that stupid little X with a thing is out on our door? You're like, why did they choose that? It's cr- because it represents Christ, right? The classic Greek shorthand for Christos, X, without the hyphen. Unhyphenated Christianity. So what we want people to try to be is just a Christian, Not a Freemason Christian, right? Or a sorority Christian, or a Republican Christian, or a Democratic Christian, or a Trump Christian, or or whatever. Or a Reformed Christian, or a Free Will Christian, or a Methodist Christian, or a Charismatic Christian, or a Prophetic Christian. The hyphens, the, the hyphens that we put on our Christianity diminish it. It, Your your affections are divided. Your light is dimmed. Your saltiness doesn't season anymore. And so we want to remove that hyphen because that's the call of Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. That's the call of Matthew 5. Look at Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Do you think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets? I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why I say there's continuity with what Jesus teaches in accordance with what the Old Testament taught, but there's also discontinuity. There's a, there's a level of authority there. But when you look at Matthew 5, 17 through 20, right? Matthew 5, 17, 20 says, hey, you have to have a righteousness that's greater than that of the Pharisees. And you go, well, how in the world do you do that? The answer that he gives in every example in verses 21 through 48 is you must not be a hypocrite. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. He's talking about a a duplicitous person who looks at the law and goes, "Ah, thou shalt not murder. Check. He says, that's not what we're after. There's a dual affection that's going on there. There's a desire to be right in the eyes of God, hence do not murder. However, there is an unwillingness to take the narrow gate and the narrow way of reconciling with someone at whom you're angry and who's angry at you, which is why he says, if you're offering your gift at the altar and they remember that at, at the altar your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. This is the narrow gate and the narrow way that Christ is beckoning us to walk. That's wholehearted, single-minded devotion to Yahweh. Not like, you know, man, he or she sure is good looking. You shall not commit adultery. No harm in looking. That's the rule me and my wife have. It's not the rule me and my wife have. <laughs> I feel like she's got tracers on my eyes, you know? Like, there's, a, there's a garbage can. For crying out. I'm just looking at it. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. Don't be the kind of person that says, you should not commit adultery. Check. <laughs> uh, and the law hides a duplicitous heart that lusts and wants and desires. Jesus says, take the narrow gate. 
pluck out some eyes and cut off some hands for crying out loud. Press in to the kingdom. It goes on and on and on, right? Divorce, oaths, retaliation. Matthew 6, 1 through 19. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. There's a single-hearted devotion to Yahweh, and it manifests itself in a life of prayer, in a life of fasting, in a life of, in a life of helping the poor and being generous, right? But if there's not a single-minded devotion to that, and we put a hyphen in front of it, what we do is we take religious actions and we prostitute them out for the praise of other people. And Jesus says, I'm calling you to a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. Right? I used to go to worship because I would get tired of my mom and dad getting on to me about not going to worship. Then I would sit in the lobby so I could arrive when I wanted to until my mom and dad were like, hey, that's not where you should sit. That's not where you should sit, right? Wide gate, wide way. Oh, I just wish they'd get off my back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go sit in the nurse and mother's room. I used to sit in the nurse's and mother's room at O'Neill. It was like a, um, a drug dealer's car. You couldn't see into it. The windows were so tinted or out of it hardly. So that's where I'd sit. No offense to any drug dealers out there. And so, Matthew 6, 24 through 34, right? I mean, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart shall be also. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, He is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. No one can serve two masters. For he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. Over and over and over again, the Sermon on the Mount, it's one of its main themes is a single-minded devotion to Yahweh. Matthew 7, 1-6. through Judge not that you be not judged. For the judgment you pronounce, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. Hey, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye and don't notice the log that's coming out of your own? That's awfully duplicitous. That's, not a, that's no way to live. <laughs> Matthew 7, 7 through 12. Ask and it will be given to you. You don't have to be like Adam and Eve. You don't get to go around the back door and climb the wall to get to the tree that God says you aren't supposed to have? Ask. God will give you good things. Seek. He'll help you find good things. Knock. He'll open the door. Everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. The one who knocks, it'll be open. Right? How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Those things, that mindset, is the narrow gate and the narrow way. The first thing that Jesus does in Matthew is he unties a legalistic knot in a national religion. And one of the things... Man, i got two minutes left. One of the things that we would do well to think about is how did it get there in the first place? How did it get this way? Here's how it gets this way. Here's how the narrow gate and the narrow way becomes the sinner's prayer, baptism by immersion, baptism by sprinkling, the Romans road, covenant children, praying through with tongues. No one speaks in tongues. Don't even think about it. You know. That, 
It's really easy for us to use religious constructs and substitute them for the narrow gate and the narrow way so that we do not have to do the hard work of entering by the narrow gate and entering in the narrow way. It's easier to say we're justified, and I'm not picking on church. This is an example. We're justified because we don't use instruments. Don't do it. That's the narrow way. Okay. I can still hold a grudge. I can still neglect my family. I don't have to provide for them. I don't have to honor my mother or father. I don't have to do the work of being single minded, single minded devotion to Yahweh. I just have to go to a place and hear to a creed, whether it's spoken or not, feel the acceptance of people in that place who worship the Lord, have my conscience cleansed because He has completely forgiven me. And I don't even have to worry about what road I'm on. That's the way it works. That's the way it's always worked. That's why legalism is so attractive. It appeals to the side of ourselves that says, I don't need God's help. I can do it. Show me what to do. And it appeals to the lazy side of ourselves that says, I don't really want to climb the mountain of the Beatitudes. So if you can put me on the straight and narrow with some set of rules to be justified, I'll keep them. Because we would rather do easy things in the name of the Lord than to actually walk the road and the gate, right, that bears his street name. And we don't know it at the time. We don't even think about it all that much, right? And that's why Jesus can come and teach Deuteronomy 6.4 repurposed And they marvel at it. It's it's really remarkable to think about because here's what happens, right? here's, Here's what happens. Attached to that view, negative one minute. I got four minutes. Attached attached to that view, right, is A faulty ground, or when I mean ground, I mean a justification for having that view, all right? Namely, it's hard, it's difficult, there are few who find it, I either can't do it, I'm afraid, I don't want that life, because it seems restrictive. And so legalism offers us the best of both worlds. The sense of justification in that we've actually done what God wants, the removal of guilt, and the safety and security that it really rests with us and no one else. That's all baked in to a faulty presupposition, namely that Christ's yoke is not easy and his burden is not light, which is not true. Come to me, all you labor, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek, gentle, and lowly at heart, and you will find rest into your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When you begin, when we begin to walk with the Lord in a single-minded devotion, going through the narrow gate on the narrow way, what he does is he opens up right? A view of reality that's fundamentally different from that of the world's. And you find pleasures forevermore and unspeakable joys as you begin to actually walk with him and learn from him and sit with him and dine with him and fellowship with him and commune with him. It is a sweeter road and a more beautiful gate once you go through it than you could have ever imagined when you you walk through it the first time. You begin to see everything differently. 
everything begins to make more sense. You begin to see people differently. You begin to see your wife differently, your kids differently, your relationships differently. You begin to see beauty when no one, when no one else can see it. Everyone else sees pain. Everyone else sees destruction. You see God's kindness, God's mercy. It is a supernatural thing that occurs when we enter in through that gate and remove the duplicity and say, I'm only carrying one business card. Sorry, Sides Auto Body. I'm selling real estate now. And we just commit to that thing. That's what we were made to do. And we were made to be. We were made for God. We were made to be with God. We were made to be satisfied by God. We were made for eternal joy, hope, fellowship with God. We're not made for anything else. All the hyphens that we put in front of everything, including God, rob us of the singular-minded focus for which we were created. It's to know God and to love God and to enjoy God and to be with God. And what Jesus does is he comes to a people who've got it all backwards. They love the praise of men that, instead of the praise of God. They love to use God's religious institutions for their own benefit or for their own gain. They're duplicit in their mind and thought and actions. And he says, true joy, true happiness, true wisdom is found in a singular-minded devotion to Yahweh and his commands. A life lived otherwise is morose. It's moronic. It's foolish. And that's what the invitation at the end of the sermon is all about. Choose the path for which you were created. And what you will find is that, I mentioned this in the prayer, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. I think this is what Paul means. We work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. For, now this is the reason we fear and tremble. We don't fear and tremble because I might fail at working it out, I'm going to be lost. For it is God who works in you. We work on our own salvation and we fear and we tremble while we do it. And we fear and tremble because of this magnificent thought. God works in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So when we take the narrow gate and we walk the narrow way and we experience this life in Christ, the fear and trembling comes from this reality. The God of the universe is working in my working. He's doing in my doing. And all of it is for his good pleasure, my good, and the glory of his grace. And we're no longer morons. That's the good news. So here's the invitation. Am I going to do it? Yeah. Don't be, don't be a moron. <laughs> don't be foolish. Be wise. Don't be like the, the animal that has to be steered by the bridle, right? You got to put it in his mouth and whip that jack and get him going in the way you want to go. My prayer is that the Lord would work and move and open our eyes to see the beauty of the narrow gate and the narrow path. I'm out of time. Let's pray. God, thank you for the way you love us. Thank you for what you put before us, life or death, blessing or curse, wisdom or foolishness, Jesus Christ and rubbish. Let us count all things rubbish so that we might see the surpassing worth of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Do this for us as we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling knowing that it's you who work in us, both to will and to work for your good pleasure. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.